Trail runners versus hiking boots. This is the age old battle that people have been fighting for years. Both have their purposes, but most people should probably be using trail runners the majority of the time. So today I'm gonna break down the pros and cons of trail runners versus hiking boots in multiple little categories. Then I'll go over why most people fail when they try to make the switch to trail runners. Now I got the most extreme examples here from a five finger shoe. Uh, some people do wear these hiking. There was a guy actually on top of Mount uh, Olympus I did in uh, Colorado who had big calluses and he hiked the whole thing just barefoot. Uh, the, the, all, the polar opposite here is the giant Scarpa boot. This thing weighs a ton. Our first category is lightweight. So let's break these all down. I'm gonna weigh these all for you right now so you can get an idea and a spectrum. And just to note, all my boots here aside from the Scarpa are lighter weight hiking boots. They have a bit of flex to them. Not a, not a lot, but this is a lot more uh, soft than a typical hiking boot for that reason. I rarely ever hike with a heavy boot. I don't even own any aside from this Scarpa boot that my dad gave me, which is from like the 1980s or 1990s. Okay, so we'll fire through these real quick. The five finger shoe is 163 grams. This is Saucony Mad River, 306 grams. Merrill FST Moab, I believe it's called. This is 308 grams. This is the same thing, but half a size smaller. Ironically, it's 320 grams. This is a Skechers Go Run, which is 212 grams. This is a, an Adidas Terex Trail Runner which is 315 grams. So you can see they're all in that range. Typically you can just round it off to 300 grams per shoe for trail runners. Now there are some lighter ones and once you get into zero drop and all those, then you start getting that down and down and down into the 200s. A lot like this one, these Skechers. Now, I don't hike with these. These are more of a training shoe I used to use on the trails. I burned off all the, the rubber though. So now going over these ones, this is a Merrill. This is 479 grams. Same thing, this is a Merrill FST uh, version one. This is 465 grams. This is the same boot, but half a size bigger with a different color. This is 465 grams and rounding off with a big heavy honk and Scarpa is 757 grams. If we freeze here for a second, here are a bunch of other popular hiking boots, often ones that are much skinnier that my wide feet don't fit into. You'll notice many of these are heavier than my big Scarpa boots. If you want to check out further details, I'll have these all linked in the description down below. So just going over the weight alone, we've got more than double the weight is this than the, the average trail runner. And when we're talking boots to this, it's, it's slightly less than double the weight. So either way, it's <laughs> rounding it off, it's double the weight for a hiking boot versus a trail runner. Now, why is this important? Well, there's a saying that one pound on your feet equals five pounds on your back. That's a saying that comes from Sir Edmund Hillary, guy who did a trek up Mount Everest in 1963, I believe, that's his quote. And since then, scientific research has basically proven that, maybe not exactly to the, those numbers, but it's true when you have weight on your extremities, it carries different than on your body. So some people might say, if you're carrying five pounds, you're carrying five pounds, but if you put ankle weights on your ankles and walk around, it feels very different than if you take five pounds off you know, those ankle weights and put them in a backpack and walk around. Certain parts of your body are not meant to hold certain loads of weight. It's just like if you had an earring and you hooked on five pounds of ankle weights, that's not gonna feel good. Now let's move on to comfort. Now if you ever worn a big honking hiking boot like this, they're not comfortable, but they are really good at going over sharp stuff like scree and rock and moraines, that kind of thing. You know, where glaciers leave big cascading rivers of dry rock. Uh, that's where a hiking boot is useful and that's honestly the only time I'd ever wear a big hiking boot. The entire trail was just scree, then I would wanna wear a big hiking boot. Otherwise, I'd wanna go with a trail runner because they're just so much more comfortable. I mean, it's right in the name, trail runner. You can run with these, they flex. It just feels good on your feet. For me, I always wear ones that are really wide and as you get more into this, you'll realize that, you know, as we evolve as humans, our feet are meant to be splayed out as we're walking and a lot of these shoes get really tapered in and it crunches your feet and as you spend your entire day hiking you're going to get this crunched feeling in your foot and if you end up getting a wider shoe it just feels so much better now for me this started out as a necessity because i have wide feet so something to think about always try to get a wider shoe it'll be a lot more comfortable and it'll be better for the muscles in your legs especially if you're doing big miles 20 20 miles a day that kind of thing our next category here, we're gonna talk breathability. Now this should be pretty obvious if you're looking at this, this Scarpa and most, a lot of uh, trekking boots, they're, they're made of leather, which is great for uh, weatherproofing. 
but they're not good for breathability, so your feet sweat in these things. Sweaty feet isn't a good thing either because you often get blisters and your skin starts peeling up and rubbing and ripping off and all that kind of stuff. So having something like this, where it actually has spots in the shoe where it's designed to drill holes, you can take a drill and drill it through here so it actually drains the water out. It's, these are just made for breathability. I'm a big fan of this one. I'm not sponsored by Merrill. I wish I was. You can see here I've got Vibram, Saucony, Merrill, Merrill, Skechers, Adidas, Merrill, 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 and Scarpa. So Merrill's are really wide shoes, which is why I like them. But this one has like a knit pattern on it, which it's taken a lot for it to start to rip off and break apart. Even when we look at the other ones like the Saucony, same thing, it's got spots you can uh, drill holes in it to have drainage as well as just the material itself lends well to breathe. Now the only downside to that, if it starts pouring rain, these aren't gonna repel as well as these ones, uh, like a big hiking boot, but there are some with I've noticed they, they starting to come with these weather kind of proofing trail runners. They still can breathe, but they can repel water. And if you put a gator on there, then it kind of gets the both best of both worlds. Especially if you're running, you actually heat up your feet. It dries out your shoes really fast. Some of these materials are made to dry out quickly. Now let's talk seasons. Now this is the only time we're going to start to lean over to the hiking boots here, depending on the season. I'm talking about winter. In the winter time, this is my winter boot right now. This is, I believe, a Merrill Moab 2, something like that. Winter is a tough one. You basically want a warmer boot, something thicker. You wouldn't wear trail runners. This is the only time I wouldn't wear trail runners is in the winter, unless it's hard packed. Uh, you can put some micro spikes on and you can run and you're gonna be running the whole day, so you're gonna keep your feet warm by running. You're not gonna be stopping much, and there's not a lot of water. You can potentially get in there, it's not raining. Uh, maybe then, and you put some gaiters on so you're not getting snow in your, in your boots. But I mean, you're putting gaiters on this too anyways. Uh, these are just a little thicker, and they're gonna be warmer as well as waterproof. So winter is the only time I'd be using boots, and this is what I use for winter. This is a flexible boot too. I don't wear big honking, uh, Scarpa <laughs> in the winter, I just can't do it. So that's that's gonna be a win for the, the, the boots is winter time, otherwise spring, fall, summer, it's always trail runners. If it's raining, then I always wanna bring some sort of gaiter, try to keep my feet uh, a little bit drier and I don't try to go out in the rain that much. Um, I always bring proper rain stuff anyways and if, depending on how far you're going, whatever, then you want change of socks, that kind of thing. You can always take all your insoles and dry them out overnight if you're camping. Uh, there's no question, <laughs> this boot is from like this, like I said, the 80s or the 90s. My dad's old boot, he did the Grand Canyon. And durability, like this does not even have like any punctures or holes. Hiking boots, especially these big heavy ones like Scarpas, they're just like the durability kings. They really are. Um, even the tread looks still good, even though some of it's burned off, like it's still good to go. So durability, always hiking boots is better. But then I guess let's mix this in right now with the next category, which is cost. So <laughs> we're looking at cost. These things cost like 450 bucks Canadian, like 300 US, something like that. And it varies. You can get cheaper ones. You can get more of the 400 US, uh, 500 Canadian, 550. It's, it, it just, it all ranges up into the multiple hundreds of dollars for a hiking boot. It lasts long though, durability, cost. So if you're looking at shoes, you're looking at maybe 100, 150, 200 bucks, and that's Canadian or US. And so you can technically buy two pairs or maybe three pairs of trail runners for one hiking boot. So I mentioned briefly before flexibility. So if you got something like this, there's no flexibility. <laughs> and that's for a reason. It's for walking on scree and rocks and moraines, big you know, rock fields left by glaciers, that kind of stuff. You're not stabbing your feet all day. You can walk on it with a hard boot like this. So that's, you know, great for that. But I find most hikes, every, almost every hike I've ever done, it only has maybe half a kilometer, 100 meters, maybe a kilometer of, of scree. And then it gets onto something else. Like you're not spending all day on scree. If you are, I would recommend wear a boot. If you're on scree all day, wear a boot. You'd rather have the heavy boot and walk on rocks all day. But most other situations, you can walk on this. You just, you know, you just have to be a little more careful. Pick your steps, flat spots, not just jam on any big rock. But if you look at the flexibility of this, these things flex, they really do. And when you're, when you're moving it, that's just how your foot moves. Like your foot wants to flex. It wants to use all the muscles and properly grab the ground. It just feels better. It's better for the tendons in your leg. It's better for your muscles. It's just better for your body to have something that isn't rigid and hard, in my opinion. And our final category is ankle support. You knew it was coming. Ankle support, ankle support. 
ankle support. Well, let me tell you, there's a problem with that ankle support thing. There's a lot of people that switch from hiking boots to trail runners and they have problems, their legs hurt, their ankles hurt, and they don't really understand why. Let me point this out to you in the simplest way possible. So we've got this boot here, and would you rather have this boot support your ankle, this material, see this? Do you want this supporting your ankle, this piece of fabric that I can easily move around with my hand? Or would you rather have the muscles and tendons in your leg support your ankle? See, this is the problem. Just think about this, the IT band in your leg can hold an African elephant. This thing's said to hold at least 10,000 pounds. There's no reason why we should be like relying on a boot to support our ankle. There's only one situation where you'd want a boot giving you ankle support. Now, if you twist your ankle really bad and you just need to hobble your way out off the trail back to your car, what you can do is tie up your boot really high, use the highest points on your boot and tie it up really tight. And that will give you ankle support. What it'll do is re reduce mobility in your ankle. Now, what that does though, while taking the load off your ankle, it drives that force up into your knee. So that's why a lot of people who wear boots, they go on the downhills, their knees always hurt. It's because you're, you're taking that tension off your ankle and you're driving it somewhere else. I don't think wearing a boot just for the rare occasion that you twist your ankle is a good idea. See, if you strengthen your ankles properly, you won't twist your ankle. There's four times last year where, you know that time you step on a rock and you snap your ankle over and you're like, Ugh, and you're just expecting it to be, you know, pulled. You pull the ankle, you twisted it and it feels terrible. And then I just kind of picked my leg up and I was like, oh, it's not sprained. See, that's what happens when you keep training your ankles. It's really hard to sprain your ankles. Now, the only time I sprain my ankle is if I'm not training properly for it. And we'll break this down real quick. So if you're typically, say in the gym or just normal backpacking, say you always, always carry 30 pounds of backpacking gear and that's it, never more. It's just always around 30 pounds. And then you go out, you know, a couple weeks later and you take a 45 pound pack. Now you're more likely to twist your ankle because your your body's tendons, muscles, all your supportive tissue is used to and built up around 30 pounds of weight. So now you're, you've exceeded that and you didn't train up for it. So really what I do is I go in the gym with a 60 pound, 70 pound, 80 pound backpack on the Stairmaster and then go backpacking with 30 pounds or max 40 pounds. That way I'm not going to twist my ankles ever because I'm used to carrying 80 pounds on my back. So this is what you should be doing. Now there's tons of different exercises and stretches and I'll have to break this up in other videos because I could be talking for hours and hours and hours as I've had to spend the last two and a half years fixing all these problems with my own body. But we'll go over a few here for you. Let's take this outside. All right, so now we're outside. Let's do a few exercises and stretches to strengthen your ankles and your legs so you don't need those heavy hiking boots anymore. So one of the foundation exercises is doing a pistol squat. A pistol squat is very difficult to do, so you're gonna have to work up to this. I don't re recommend doing pistol squats on a very steep slope like this. I don't know if you can tell how steep this is, but basically it's bending down with one leg and having the other leg up. What this does is just strengthens everything in there. It just makes it strong as steel. So you just wanna, and you can hold on to something like this. You can also hold on to like a, a couple bars. If there's dip bars, you go in the gym, just grab on anything. And when you lower yourself down, you can use that weight to just take off some of the, the, the weight of your body on for your ankles. And eventually you can just get that to a point where you just, you know, crank that out. So the next exercise you wanna do is you can get a plate or some sort of raised elevation. We can use a tree here. So all you wanna do is put your, your heels up onto something. So like a slant board, something like that. It's too hard against a tree. So yeah, if, if you're angled like this, if you take a kettlebell and you just do body weight squats, you can just start by doing with nothing, just straight body weight. And then you can get a, a plates or a kettlebells, 50 pounds, something like that, work your way up to that. And it works every single, angle of your legs and it just strengthens it. Another thing you wanna do is tibialis raises. This is something nobody does. And that's all you wanna do is find a wall and lean against it kind of like a 45 degree angle. So there's, you know, you're not straight up, you're out and you're taking your toes and you're pulling them up like that. And you're just doing that. And the more you kind of lean forward, the easier it is. As you get back here, it hurts more. And we're just trying to lift our toe up to our knee. After about 10 of them, it hurts like heck. So I do like 50 of those every single day. Um, the reason for that, tibialis raises, is what is the catching force when you're going downhill. So when you're landing like this, 
that's essentially catching my body weight on every step down. So if you don't have that, when you, what ends up happening is you're one of those people who's complaining that your knees hurt on downhills. So your tibialis, which is the muscle on the front of your shin here, that's what's getting sore. So you always wanna be doing those tibialis raises. Now a big one is we want mobility. So we're gonna do what is called like an Asian squat. You basically just wanna be able to squat. See, do I disappear out of camera? No. Nope. So all the way down, you wanna be able to basically just squat. We can do different variations of this, not only just kind of squatting down here. You can roll your head forward, lock your arms over your knees and pull down. You can also do like a prayer, put your hands between your, your legs and push out. You can try tucking in your feet really tight and doing this, pushing out. You can also do straight knees and you can see the whole time I'm on a slope too and I'm holding this and I can feel my ankles burning, my toes, my pads and my feet and it just feels great. And then, you know, come up out of that. You can also do that if you're holding some, some kettlebells or dumbbells and you can go up in your toes here like this, right? You can go on your toes and then be holding some dumbbells and then squat into that while staying up high like this. Or you can just do body weight, just work into body weight. You can do assisted body weight. So you're holding onto a bar while doing this and then work your way up. And that just feels fantastic. It's just burning all the way up here, right on the sides. The size of your legs here, there's actually a muscle in between the shin and the, the calf called extensor digitorum. Uh, I believe it's, uh, there's multiple ones. There's longest and there's another one, but basically there's tiny muscles in between, but they're so imperative for stabilization and they curl underneath onto the bottom of your foot. It like catches it. What we want to do is stretch and lengthen this muscle so it gives us more mobility. We can do this by sticking our butt between our heels in a kneeling pose. Downward dog with heel taps is excellent as it lengthens your calf where often mobility is reduced. A great exercise that not only strengthens the ankle but also the knee is to put your foot in a kettlebell and lift it. I do three sets of 10 with a 20 pound weight but I'm ready to move up to 25 or 30 pounds now. So another one for your ankles, often the motion of twisting it is this, it's outwards. Um, sometimes you can kind of twist it inwards and you tear off the side here but most of the time it's this way you're snapping. So what you're going to do is do this in a gym, not on a slope surface like I am now but you want to just step on it like that and then slowly do squats into that and really lean into that and just train your ankles to actually hold that position and as you get stronger and stronger you can do that uh, just with barely any weight on your other foot and you'll just get stronger and stronger and this motion will not give you that you know you, you'll be a lot more resistant to actually t twisting your ankle. I also recommend trying different other angles like this having your foot this way you can try to torque it this way you just want to hit all the angles and also you can do on your toes as well. So like that one before, you can do your toes out this way, your toes in this way, and then just, you know, get into a, a squat like that. And holding onto a bar is the best way to do this because then you can just really alleviate that pressure as you need it removed if you get too low. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you want to check out, I have other hiking videos, hiking gear related videos, as well as adventure videos. I'm an adventure filmmaker from Vancouver Island, so I've got... Uh, over 120 episodes if you're into that. Be sure to subscribe and I'll see you on the next one.